You're tuned in to the New Life Fellowship audio service. Here at New Life, we believe in facilitating a worship service that reflects the abundant new life that Jesus wants to give us in John 10.10. As you listen to today's sermon, feel free to share points that stand out to you on social media and use the hashtag NewLifeAU to join the national conversation. Enjoy today's message. Father in heaven, it is difficult sometimes to come before you and to give you everything. And we want to be honest this morning and admit that there are some things that we are still holding on to because there's so much uncertainty that surrounds us. But it has been a great privilege to lift up those burdens before you today and declare I surrender everything. Not only everything, but I surrender all of me. And God, we think you're that strong. We think you can carry all of it. We believe in your abilities. And we receive the peace that you give to us in this moment. That all things will work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. I believe that the word today is going to require of us a heavy amount of honesty and transparency. And so I want you to take this moment to try to block out anything that would distract you from very much, very intentionally engaging our dialogue today. So just in this moment, all around the building, I'm just wanting you to release whatever would be in your mind to distract you from the word today. It will require a very high level of focus. We are continuing our upgrade series, and the continuation of the series will take place in 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21. And I'm going to begin in verse 15, and we're going to journey all the way down to verse 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 15. We're going to take a journey all the way down to verse 21. I will be reading from the New Living Translation, but feel free to read in a translation of your choice. If you can see it, say, "Uh uh-oh. Oh, that sounds good. Verse 15 reads, once again, the Philistines were at war with Israel. And when David and his men were in the thick of battle, David became weak and exhausted. I want you to recognize that most of us know the story of the first time David fought a giant. But few of us know the story of the second time he is seen fighting giants. Verse 15, David became weak and what? Anybody weak and exhausted today? Anybody kind of feeling that? Yeah, somebody can relate to David. Well, let's move on to verse 16. Ishbi Banab was a descendant of the giants. His bronze spearhead weighed more than seven pounds, and he was armed with a new sword. Say new sword. He had cornered David and was about to kill him. So recognize, David is not successful on his second battle against giants. Verse 17. I love that first word there. It's really good in the Bible. But... Abishai, son of Zeruah, came to David's rescue and killed the Philistine. Then David's men declared, you are not going out to battle with us again. Why risk snuffing out the light of Israel? Verse 18. After this, there was another battle against the Philistines at Gob, and they fought Sebekai from Husha. Excuse me. As they fought, Sebekai from Husha killed Saph, another descendant of the giants. That's two giants. Verse 19. During another battle at Gob, Elhanan, son of Jer, from Bethlehem, killed the brother of Goliath of Gath. Man, that's three giants. 
The handle of his spear was as thick as a weaver's beam. Verse 20, and this is where our key text is today. In another battle with the Philistines at Gath, they encountered a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in all, who was also a descendant of the giants. Have you guys read about this giant before? 24 fingers and toes. My goodness. Verse 21, our final text. But when he defied and taunted Israel, he was killed by Jonathan, the son of David's brother, Shimea. But when he defied and taunted Israel, he was killed by Jonathan, the son of David's brother, Shimea. With the help of the Holy Spirit, I simply want to present unto, un, unto you today the theme upgrade your family upgrade your family may everything that you have shown me and promised me happen here today father in jesus name amen upgrade your family so uh in hollywood this summer is being termed the summer of sequels The summer of sequels. And it's getting this reputation because throughout the summer, there's an anticipation for a few blockbuster hits that are based on stories that we've already heard, already have been told once before. And they're simply trying to continue uh, the story. So the largest one and most anticipated sequel of the summer actually starts our summer off. It releases on graduation weekend. Some of you will be celebrating in a theater near you the release of Avengers Part 2, right? Man, can't wait for it. I was there for Part 1. One thing that I'm excited about is my birthday always lands on the first weekend of May. My birthday is May the 3rd. So every single year, I get to celebrate my birthday with a new Marvel release of some sort. Just happens all the time. And so I'm excited that for my birthday... Can you just say amen again? For my birthday, I will be celebrating over the Avengers part two. It better not be worse than part one because I hate that. Hate that. But then in the middle of the summer, we have a special treat. There's going to be a sequel that we haven't seen for quite some time. Uh, The release of the next installment of Jurassic Park, Jurassic World. Now, some of you guys can remember the fact that when the first kind of set of Jurassic Parks came out, you were probably a little jit in an elementary classroom somewhere in the country, right? Some of you guys even had the Jurassic Park action figures and you would fight with your different dinosaurs during recess. But now as an adult, we get to take in Jurassic Park. Yes. But then at the end, at the end of our summer, we have the next installment of the Fantastic Four. Oh, some of y'all aren't hip to game, huh? Fantastic Four comes out in August, right at the end of our summer, and it's the next installment. Looks like it may be a little bit of a remake. It doesn't look as corny as the first ones we saw. Looks like they're going to try to take a page out of the Dark Knight series and kind of bring it home with a little bit more realism if it's possible. And we get to see Mr. Fantastic once again attempt to lead his team to save the world. It's a summer of sequels. But there's been one trailer that made me sad, made me weep. It is also a much anticipated movie coming out this summer. But when I saw it, it just made me feel as if time is passing us by. When I saw the trailer of the next Terminator. (laughs) Made me sad. Because that's not the Terminator that I watched in middle school and even some in high school. It's just not my Terminator. I mean, the only thing that that Terminator has in common with my Terminator is the accent. That's it. That's it. But my man Arnold Schwarzenegger has, he's grown a little older since my first Terminator. I didn't know robots could age, to be honest. Didn't know that was possible, but somehow the technology has just evolved over time. And even robots age, because I'm looking at my Terminator. He's a little bit more wrinkly. He's a little bit more wrinkly. Doesn't have as much hair as he did 
before. You know, when he's fighting T-1000, that's my Terminator. But this Terminator, I can't, I can't, I can't really wrap my mind around how he looks. He's a little heavier now. And it's not necessarily muscle mass. Looks like there could be some body fat on this Terminator. I got sad. Because it's always sad when you see a hero age. And it's even sadder when you see that same hero become a little bit more vulnerable. And as we look at this text, the sad part about it is the first time that we saw David fighting giants, he was a young lad. He was able. He was athletic. The Bible says he was ruddy and handsome. And now we see a David that is just a bit past his prime. He can't do what he used to do. A matter of fact, we look at this hero and many people get a little sad because this time when he's fighting giants, the Bible does not say that he slung his sling and hit the giant in the forehead and then and decapitated that giant. No, in fact, it says this time he fights the giant and becomes weak and exhausted. Yeah, this is a different hero. It's not the hero we fell in love with at the beginning of 1 Samuel, but instead now we are in 2 Samuel. And he's gained a little bit of age. Time has not been kind to him, and because of that, he can't do what he used to do. I want you to recognize that this story is just not a story of heroes, but this story is also the story of your parents. I want you to go back in your mind and think of the first time that you saw your parents being vulnerable. The first time you saw your parents as being flawed. Man, wasn't that a tough day? I don't know about you, but there was a day where I caught my parents in a lie. Didn't know it was possible. I was the one who was always being reprimanded in a lie, but I actually overheard one of my parents being dishonest. And I was like, what? That shouldn't happen. I remember the day to when I overheard one of my parents curse on the phone. Never before had I even imagined that my parents knew those words. Didn't even know they knew those words. But then on the phone, I happened to be walking to knock on my dad's office and bam, heard one slip. And I was like, yo, my parents curse. Ooh, I'm a tell. I remember the first time that I ever saw one of my parents cry. You guys remember the first time you saw one of your parents cry? It's strange because usually you're the one crying. They're the one consoling. And I remember I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any any kind of inkling to know how to comfort my parents. So what I did was I ran to my room. I grabbed my piggy bank and I brought it to their room and said, you can have my money. Because I didn't know what else to do to console one of my parents. It is a very tough reality indeed when we finally recognize that our parents are vulnerable. Sociologists say this in research that the first God that a child ever has is their parent. It's either the mother or the father is their first God. And from that time forward, it is up to the parent to transfer that God-like status onto the true creator. But up to a certain age, a child can only conceptualize God in the image of their parents. And so we grow up with heroes in our home. But over time, we are introduced not only to their vulnerability, but introduced to their imperfections. See, it's not just David's children who had to look at their dad getting older and more vulnerable, even more imperfect, but it is us as well. We are the children of today, and we have an issue. Many of us are still struggling and angry with the reality that our parents were not better for us. We are still asking the question, why couldn't you get the victory over this? Why couldn't you have been better for me? Why were you gone? Why weren't you here? Why is it that you ignored me and instead put all of your attention into your profession? Why is it that even still today, you can't bring yourself to say, I'm sorry? 
we are still struggling with the reality that our families are flawed. And sadly, our families didn't tell us this early enough to where it was something we expected. It kind of came out of nowhere, like seeing David weak and exhausted and in a corner about to get killed by a giant we thought he was supposed to defeat. There were many times when you came across your parents, and I want you to know that you saw them in the moment of their greatest vulnerability. And although they tried to hide it from you, You saw them in the moments of their imperfection. And kind of like me looking at a hero that used to be strong and capable. And then looking at that same hero get old and vulnerable. You too, all of the sudden, had this major epiphany moment that conflicted with everything inside of you. When you saw that your parents maybe can't even be trusted. And I want you to know that today is the day when we need to wrestle and get beyond it. The reason you need to get beyond it is because there's something about grudges. There's something about anger, whether they are things that are are merited, whether they are reasons that, that the world will look at you and say, you know what, you have the right to be angry. The fact is your anger is going to keep you paralyzed. You cannot move forward until you reconcile all of this past baggage that may be weighing you down. And I want you to recognize that you cannot move forward in your God-given destiny until you can look your parents in the face and say, I thought you were supposed to be better. You weren't, and I forgive you. We cannot move forward as a generation. Until we start wrestling and grappling with the stuff that we thought should have been different at home. And I believe God is trying to give us an awesome example here in 2 Samuel chapter 21. But I want you to look with me at verse 20. And I want to read this again. And I'm going to also read verse 21 because there's a secret here that we must embrace. Verse 20 reads this way. 2 Samuel chapter 21. In another battle with the Philistines at Gath, they encountered a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in all, who was also a descendant of the giants. Verse 21 says this. There was someone in the audience. His name was Jonathan, the son of David's brother, Shimea. Now, this is why you have to pay attention to the Bible. It's always trying to give you hints and clues. It says that this is David's nephew. His name is Jonathan, which means he is the son of one of David's brothers. That brother's name is Shimea. Now, recognize the first time there's a giant that comes against David's family, who is also present there? His brothers. One of those brothers was named Shimea. Now, watch this dynamic, because sometimes we don't read the Bible as if it's real life. We read it as if it's just some mythical tale that really has no connection to what we deal with. Notice, when Jonathan goes to family reunions, all of the other cousins make fun of him and his dad because his dad never had the courage to fight the giant. Man, you can hear this thing playing out. There was 40 days when Shimea should have stepped up and fought the giant named Goliath. 40 days when this giant taunted Israel and cursed their religious order, even blasphemed the name of their God. There were 40 days where Shimea stood cowardly on the hilltop and looked down below and watched this villain do whatever he wanted to when he wanted to. And Jonathan had to grow up knowing that his dad didn't have the courage to do what Uncle David did. Can you see those conversations with your son? As Jonathan comes into the room and he's crying, and his dad asks him, what are you crying for? Dad, they were making fun of me. What did they say? They said that my dad was a coward. That only Uncle David had the courage to fight Goliath. Dad, is that true? And what a moment that was when Shimea had to look at his son and say, yeah, that's true. 
See, Jonathan really didn't have that much time to see his dad as a hero because that story was told throughout the nation over and over again about how King David delivered Israel, how he was young. Many scholars believe a teenager. So why didn't the grown man named Shimea have the courage to step up and fight? He never got to see his dad as a hero. But instead, he had to wrestle with the fact that his dad was not only imperfect, but his dad was a coward. Some of you have these same stories. If I opened up the mic right now, you would come as a parade, one by one, telling the stories of how imperfect your home life was, about the different things that your parents struggled with, and they never got the victory over it. And many of us are still mourning the fact of our family being so dysfunctional. And we look at mom and we say, man, what is your problem? And we turn to dad and say, what were you thinking? And all the while we're trying to make sense of a reality that we grew up in dysfunction and nobody can give us a good reason why. And I want to suggest to you that the answer is more simple than you think. Your parents were weak and exhausted. That's simple. And I believe here today, we need to go ahead and concede the point that that is natural. That that is human. That even if you have a child does not mean you will be a superhero forever. Does not mean that you will always be imperfect. Does not mean you will always win. Every single villain that comes towards the door will always get thrown back because you're so strong and powerful. No, that's the world of superheroes. That's not the world that we live in. Our parents got weak and exhausted. And I want to show you the three reasons why. Three reasons why. The first reason is they came up against a giant named Ishbi. Verse 16 says, Ishbi Banab was a descendant of the giants. His bronze spearhead weighed more than seven pounds, and he was armed with a new sword. I want you to see what Ishbi represents. Ishbi represents a brand new struggle. See, some of you look at your parents and you think they should have known better. But many of us don't don't stop to, to maybe consider the fact that there was some type of giant that came against your parents that had something they had never seen before. They were ill equipped to handle it. Nobody ever mentored them and prepared them to take that giant on. And what happened? They got weak and they got exhausted. I think we need to look at the fact that every sin that comes our way, yes, the Bible says that temptations are common to man, but man is talking about humanity. That does not mean temptations, every single one is common to you. There are different temptations that have come against your family. And you know what? Sad to say it, but you were the first child in the first family in your line that ever had to deal with the reality that you had parents that are for the first time dealing with this giant. The Bible says Ishbi was armed with something new, a brand new struggle. And I need us to come together, look at our parents within our consciousness and say, my goodness, I never considered the fact that you may have been defeated by a giant that you had never seen before. That came with a weapon that you had never encountered before. But see, that's not everybody's story. Here's another giant that may have come against your family. It continues there in verse 18. Verse 18 reads this way. After this, there was another battle against the Philistines at Gob as they fought Sebekiah from Husha killed Saf, another descendant of the giants. I want you to see what Saf represents. Saf represents family struggle. So there was a new struggle, but then there's a family struggle. Every single person in here comes from a line of dysfunction. There is some type of giant who's actually been defeating your family for centuries now. I want to prove it to you. The text says that Saf was of the descendants 
of giants. That word there is Rephaim. The first time you see the Rephaim coming against Israel is actually before the Israelites were supposed to enter into the Canaan land the first time. The spies go into the land. They come back out of that land and they give a report. Joshua and Caleb say that we can take the land. But the other ten say no because there are giants in the land and we are like grasshoppers before them. The the whole nation votes to go with the ten and because of that they remain in the wilderness for 40 more long years. These are the same giants that intimidated Israel centuries ago. And some people don't like to talk about this language of generational curses. But I want you to know that, yes, some of your parents fell because there was something brand new that came. But other of your parents fell because there was a family struggle that no member of your family has yet defeated. There is a struggle in your family that you are dealing with now. And some of you have not been told that this was a family struggle, that this is a generational issue. So you think you're just by yourself and you haven't told anyone in your family. But oh, if you would have the courage to maybe open up that conversation with grandma. Oh, if you are able to engage grandpa, auntie or uncle, there's someone in the family who will have the courage to tell you all of us fell to that giant see there's new struggle but then there's family struggle and some of your parents could not do better by you because they fell to the same giant that's gotten the best of your family for hundreds of years and this is why it's so important as you have your own children to tell your children the story of dysfunction in your family. Do not hide it for fear that you will not be able to shelter them from it because I have news for you. It's in their bloodstream. And it's going to come out at some point and they're going to have to fight against that giant. So you might as well equip them now to do so. There was a new struggle, but then there was a family struggle. That's one last struggle. We read about that here in First Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 5. The giant that Elhanan killed is not named, is not named in 2 Samuel. But in First Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 5, we get his name. Same story, different book. It reads, during another battle with the Philistines, Elhanan son of Jer killed Lamai or Lami, the brother of Goliath of Gath. Notice this next giant. Lami stands for an old struggle. Now, why do I say old struggle when we just talked about family struggle? Are they the same? No, because right now I'm not talking about an old struggle that your family has had. I'm talking about an old personal struggle that your parents have. Lami was the little brother of Goliath. Now watch this. If any little brother hears a story that someone killed big brother, what are they doing for the rest of their life? They're preparing to take out the same clown that took out my big brother. This is little brother. All he wants to do is be like Goliath. And sometimes we objectify the villains in the Bible and act like they don't have emotions. Just because he's a Philistine does not mean he does not have feelings. Lami grew up saying, if there's one thing I vow to do before heaven and earth, I will kill David someday. Because he killed my brother. And so now Lami is stronger. Now Lami is faster. Now Lami has trained harder. Now Lami is more determined. See, Goliath took David for granted, but Lami is very focused. He knows what David is capable of, and he will not make the same mistake. See, Lami represents a struggle that you personally defeat, but it comes back stronger later on. See, some of you saw some imperfections in your family, in your home, in your parents. And let me tell you, you thought your parents never got the victory over it. What your parents probably didn't have the courage to tell you is that they actually got the victory over that. Yeah, dad was a womanizer back in college, but then he became converted and he married the best woman he's ever met, the love of his life, only to cheat on her in his middle ages. Because Lami came back. 
He thought he defeated it back in college, but he did not know that that same giant had a little brother and that little brother was watching and that little brother was determined to make sure I got the victory over you this time. Mom did, yes, mom did struggle with depression. When she was a teenager, she just struggled with this low self-esteem. She hated herself and she hated everybody else. But you know what? She started turning. She started turning into college. She got a little stronger. As a young professional, she got even better. But then something happened. Something really hurt her in her later years. And right about the time she had you, she was dealing with this same incident. And you know what? That depression came back stronger. And that's why she never had any love to share with you. You thought she was just a witch from the beginning. No, she actually got the victory over that before. It just came back stronger the second time. Old struggle. And I want you to see this. Second Samuel 21 and verse 15. They're going to put a slide up for you now. And I want you to look at this. I need you to put the names of both of your parents in the blank. I need you to look at this screen and put those two names in the blank. And I need you to wrestle with the fact that the reason they couldn't do more for you is because they became weak and exhausted. They came up against Ishbi, new struggle, lost. Or they came up against Saf, family struggle, lost. Or they came up against Lami, old struggle, lost. And if we're honest with ourselves and we allow ourselves to be just as human as our parents, we would probably be able to look at them and say, you know what? I know what it's like to lose to one of those giants. Already in my life, I can already show you a testimony, give you a film of how one of those three giants has also been getting the best of me. But man, in our families, probably one of the most wretched things that, that the devil has ever produced in our consciousness is we always hold our family members to a higher standard than what we hold ourselves to. So although we, have may, we may not have committed the same mistake, we still can relate to committing a mistake. And you know what? The sad part is most of our parenting is dysfunctional as well because we spend so much time getting away from making their mistake, we end up making new mistakes. When all the while... I believe what God is really wanting us to do is to look at our families and say, I will be the upgrade. I will be the one that breaks the link. I'm going to break the chain. I'm going to come up against Ishbi. Saf is not going to get the best of my unit. And you know what, Lami, I don't care how hard you're training. I'm training much harder. It's not going to happen to my family. I'm not going to allow the anger and the grudging of the past to make me so weak that I cannot fight the giants of the future. And so I look at 2 Samuel chapter 21, and I think that there is one person who can identify with all of us in this room today. That's Jonathan. He represents you and I. He represents the next generation. He represents the tension and the struggle. Because the word of God says he ended up being in the same position as his dad. The verse says that there was a huge giant with 24 fingers and toes that was down there in the valley throwing taunts at Israel. Is this not a reproduction of the same story? His dad, Shimea, stood on a mountain and heard the same things. But you know what? Jonathan's task is even greater because since his dad didn't defeat that giant, the giant is bigger when it comes to, Sh to Jonathan. Shimea's giant only had 20 fingers and toes. 
but his son's giant had 24 fingers and toes. See, what we have to recognize is there's a giant coming at you, and although you're angry that your parents fell to it, it is going to be much bigger and much stronger when it comes to your family's door. And you know what? Every parent knows what it's like to make the same mistake that their parents made with them. And they hate themselves for it because they spent all of their life vowing that they would never do that. But they did not know the giant was going to come back a whole lot bigger and a whole lot stronger. We must turn our focus away from the mistakes that were made in our families and turn our focus instead to what God wants to do through us to break those cycles. Because you have been called to defeat Ishbi. You have been called to defeat Saf. And you have been called to defeat Lami. And if you lose to one, then it is your responsibility to teach your children how to beat it. As a musician comes forward to play, one thing that I want you to see about Jonathan is that he's human just like any of us. So as he's standing on the mountainside, he's rehearsing his own family story. He's revisiting the cowardice of his family. And he has to decide whether or not he's going to be the one to go into the valley and actually believe that God can use him to beat a giant that's now way bigger than the giant that his father ran from. But I believe that Shimia was intentional about preparing Jonathan. And I believe the secret to that is in his name. If you look at the word Jonathan, I want you to see what it means. Jehovah has given. And I believe there were times when Shimia had to sit down in the utmost of humility and train Jonathan to think differently. To be differently. And he wanted his name to carry the fact that he is different. So he looks at his son and says, you know what? I didn't have courage. But you know what, son? Jehovah has given you courage. I didn't have the intestinal fortitude to stand up and fight. But you know what? Jehovah has given you that fortitude. I didn't have what it took to go up against that giant and defeat it. But Jehovah has given you what it takes. Jehovah has given you anything and everything you need to defeat what I could not defeat. This campus represents a major giant for my family. In 1988, here on this campus, my father was wounded by the church in a way that changed the course of our family for years to come. And many of us have heard the stories of how individuals have been done wrong politically in our church. And I am a testimony. I am the offspring of this hurt. There was no justification for it. My father never did anything wrong. He just happened to find himself without a side to protect him, and he became the political collateral damage of a conference war. And so, the conference sent him his final check while he was right here on this campus. And that check was for zero dot zero zero dollars. Who takes the time to write a check For zero dollars. Some of you may say that is just outlandish. No, it's not outlandish if you're trying to send a message to someone. If you want them to stare at that check and remember what they had been sent, but now know that there's nothing that's going to be there for you. One of the most sinister things to be done to anyone, and yet it was done to my father. And now he's here in the seminary, in this building, studying in these classrooms, and he has two children and a wife. And he's trying to figure out how can I provide for them now. 
and our family was thrust into a deep depression that lasted all of my childhood. We were never the same. If you ask me what giant was that, I think it was an Ishbi giant. My father had never seen that giant before. Never considered that something like this could happen. And you know what? It hurt our family. So you have to believe when I tell you how surprised I was to get a phone call asking me to return to the land of my family's giants. But I thought of this story. And nothing in me wanted to come back to Andrews University. I was only a little guy when we were here, but check this out. I remember all of the painful hurt that was in my household in Berrien Springs. Berrien Springs does not represent anything good for my family. It is the land of our giants. So why would I accept a job to come back and work here? Because I believe Jehovah has given me what I need to defeat that giant. And many of you will be called to do the same thing. You are right now even being called to return to the land of your family's giants. But I want you to be encouraged by the word that was declared over Jonathan at his birth. Your parents didn't have what it takes, but you have been given what it takes. Jehovah will send you back to that land to give your family the opportunity to once and for all defeat some giants. The giants that brought new things. The giants that brought family things. And the giants that brought old things. And the word of God says that Jonathan approached that giant and he killed the giant. The largest giant that had ever been seen. What giant are you supposed to kill? What past are you supposed to set right? I think the anger that you're carrying you is only a distraction. Trying to keep you from recognizing your true mission. Your true mission is not to dwell on the past and hate it. Your true mission is to remember the past and conquer it. For there's a giant that you're supposed to defeat. And there's a giant that your children will defeat. You are supposed to upgrade your family. And so right now, I want to call forward anyone who resonates with this word. You recognize that there is a giant, whether new family or old, that you are supposed to be conquering. And you need the empowering word of this name, Jonathan to be over your life. I want to call you forward because I don't think I'm the only one in this building that knows what it's like to have to fight some giants. I want to call you forward. I want to ask for my faith team to please come on the stage. If you're here and you're representative of the faith team, I need you to come along the stage here and just start praying over the group that is answering this appeal. Some are standing in the balcony and others are right here on the floor. If you're on the floor, I need you to just bow your heads in this moment and you're asking God to empower you to upgrade your family. And right now, as you're praying, our faith team is going to begin praying over this body who is answering this. They're just going to be doing it right here up front. You may not be able to hear them. You may hear them. You're praying in your heart for the ability to conquer the generational things, the new things, and even the old personal things. You're praying for the courage to teach your children, the next generation. For it could be that you lose to one of those giants, but you are to take heart Encourage and use your story to train your children and let them know that Jehovah has given them what it takes to conquer it.
God, in this moment, we pray against the giant of infidelity. God, we come against the giant of divorce. God, we call out the giant of alcoholism. We come against the giant of drug abuse. God, we cry out against the giant of sex outside of marriage. We come against the giant, God, of religious piety and self-righteousness. We come against the giant of poverty and debt. We come against the giant of illiteracy and a lack of education. We come against the giant that always defeats us right before we get our diploma. We come against the giant of absentee fathering. We come against the giant of indifferent mothering. We come against the giant of sibling rivalries. We come against the giant of terminal illness. We come against the giant of preventable disease. Give us power over the giant of emotional abuse. May we finally defeat the giant of physical abuse. Allow us to conquer the giant of sexual abuse. And God, we come against the giant of self-hatred. And finally, God, I call out the giant of suicide and depression. We cry out against these giants, oh God. They have had too many victories against your people. And we stand as a generation that you have given the ability to come against them, to be victorious and to conquer them, oh God. We stand because we are a generation that will commit to you to be vessels to upgrade our family. For your word does say that the sins will be passed down unto the third and fourth generation. But it also says that your grace will visit the families unto the third and the fourth generation. So God, we stand on behalf of our generations, claiming the grace and mercy of God, the power and authority to come against the giants that have defeated us for centuries. We will not allow the enemy to convince us to wallow in hatred holding grudges against what was done in the past. God, we have great reason for our hate, but instead we turn it into compassion, and we will use that energy to stand up and declare against those same giants, we will defeat you. You will fall before us. God, we will throw stones at their heads. We will cut off that head and raise it to the generation so that they see this giant has been defeated. And the giants that see this and attempt to come against us, oh God, even stronger in the future, we will teach our children to stand strong against them and make sure they never return against our families. God, with these prophetic words, we hold true to your word that greater is he that lives in us than he that is in the world. We are more than conquerors according to your word. We shall defeat these giants and upgrade our families. We claim the fact, that God, that you give us beauty for our ashes. 
You give us strength for our fear. You give us gladness where there was only mourning and peaceful victory where there is despair. We pray that you would give us what we ask for, for we desire to battle on behalf of our families. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah, well, the sermon was really um, good, at, and I realized that my family had struggled with something, and I thought that I would uh, be able to conquer it, but it keeps coming back, and it's coming back stronger, so I know that that's a giant, and it really speaks to my heart, and I could, I could really feel what he's saying, and I understand that I need to be, I need to break the chain, I need to be the upgrade for my family and so forth, so I believe that was really good. Our parents, even though we see them as the heroes of our lives they do become weak they're humans and we need to learn how to forgive them and god has given us what we need to overcome the giants in our lives and from here forward i plan on going forward and leaning on god to help me overcome the different struggles that my family has struggled with in the past what a blessing today was um, just being reminded of how much of an impact your family can be and, you know, how much they can affect your life and your future decisions is just, we all needed it. We all as students need to be reminded that family is serious, especially when we're making future decisions. We need to take that into consideration and keep God at the center of it all because he's the only one that will bring us back to focus and, you know, just allow us to have victory over all those giants that will come in the future. Thank you for listening to the New Life Fellowship audio service. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you and that you will continue to tune in. New Life is located in the Seminary Chapel on the campus of Andrews University, and our services are held every Saturday at 1145 a.m. Keep up with the latest information about what's happening at New Life by subscribing to our podcast on iTunes and through our social media connections on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Simply type in New Life AU in the search bar and you'll find us. Until next time, may the Lord bless you with a new love, new integrity, new faith, and a new experience.